Hello, this video concentrates on examination of the shoulder, particularly with regards to the acromioclavicular joint, subacromial impingement, the rotator cuff and instability. The shoulder assessment, as with all orthopedic assessments, starts with a full history, particularly including any history of neck problems as there's a significant crossover with shoulder symptoms uh, and of previous injuries and surgery. The exact site of the pain and activities that provoke or improve the pain are also important. And it's also important to know if the patient has pain at night and in particular if that pain is relieved or worsened by sleeping on the affected shoulder. So the examination starts with a visual inspection of the patient from the front and also from the back. So the first thing to do is to look at the front and we can see the height of the shoulders are symmetrical. The clavicles show no deformity, for example, from previous fractures. The acromioclavicular joints are not particularly prominent and the bulk of the deltoids on both sides are also symmetrical and normal. The general contour of the shoulders is also symmetrical, as is that of the trapezius muscle. So if we look at the back of the patient, so we can see her neck is in a normal alignment, as is her thoracic spine. The scapulae are at a normal level and symmetrical with each other, and there's no evidence of winging. Of course, that would be tested by pushing forwards onto a wall or so forth to accentuate that. We're also looking at the posterior shoulder muscle bulk, including the posterior deltoid, the trapezius muscle, and the bulk of the supraspinatus muscle and the infraspinatus muscle and the teres minor. So we can then palpate various areas. Can I get you to turn back around? And in particular, we're palpating along the clavicle, starting at the um, sternocurricular joint and moving along the clavicle here, palpating for deformity and also for discomfort, particularly around the acromioclavicular joint uh, with direct pressure over that as ACJ pain is an underrated uh, source of shoulder discomfort. We're also palpating the bulk of the uh, deltoid muscles and the trapezius on either side. If I ask you to turn around. We can also palpate the bulk of the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus on either side, the initiator of abduction and the main external rotator of the shoulder. We can't palpate effectively the subscapularis muscle as that's uh, anterior to the scapula and, and deep. We can then look at an active range of motion of the shoulder. So if we ask our subject here to put the arms out into full abduction and to touch the backs of the hands above the head with the elbows extended, we can see that there's a normal rhythm of scapulothoracic and glenohumeral movement, which is symmetrical on both sides. We can then go into full elevation at the front. And again, we can see that there's a normal scapulothoracic and glenohumeral rhythm, and down again. We're looking for catches in the movement. We're looking for asymmetries in the movement. We can then also look at movement in the plane of the glenohumeral joint. The scapula, is to be remembered, is at an angle to the coronal plane, and the glenoid is roughly perpendicular to that. So the actual axis of glenohumeral movement is more in this plane rather than the true sagittal plane. So if we asked our, our subject to move in the actual line of the glenohumeral joints forwards and backwards, and I'm doing this sort of actively assisted with an element of passive, then we can get a better understanding of whether there's actual glenohumeral pathology rather than global shoulder pathology. Similarly, abduction in the, rain, in the line of the glenohumeral joint is parasagittal. I prefer to examine the passive range, sorry, the active range of motion first, as this um, allows the patient to control their own motion uh, within their range of pain, 
uh, rather than doing a passive range first. I would only do a passive range if there's a lack of active motion uh, and then one can see if there's a muscle lag, i.e. further movement possible passively that can't be motored actively or whether there's a true block to motion because of, uh, for example, an arthritic condition. We can then move on to internal and external rotation. Functional internal rotation is with the patient placing their hand on the sacrum and then moving it up the dorsal spine as far as they can. And then we check that with symmetry to the other side, which is in this case symmetrical. Functional external rotation is with the hand placed behind the neck and check for symmetry with the other side. I get it to turn around. You can passively uh, check external and internal rotation with the elbow at 90 degrees. This would be passive external rotation and internal rotation would be behind the back. We come on to check the acromioclavicular joints in particular. We're looking to see where there's deformity here with lumps. We can press over those to see if they're painful and a specific test for the acromioclavicular joint will be the scarf test. So if our subject's left joint was painful, if I take her left arm in my hand and I pull it across like a scarf across the neck, then that compresses the clavicle onto the acromion and reproduces discomfort. If that's it, thought to be the source of pain, then an injection of a small amount of local anesthetic into that area would abolish the pain and confirm the diagnosis. We can then go on to test the rotator cuff. So if we start with supraspinatus, supraspinatus initiates abduction. So if you go to about 30 or 40 degrees of abduction with the thumb pointing downwards and ask our subject to keep the arm there while I actually push against it, I'm palpating the bulk of the muscle and there's good power there and that's to be tested against the other side. In subcranial impingement that would likely be painful or weak due to pain or weakness could also be due to a full rotator cuff tear. We can also then check uh, resistance in external and internal rotation. So if I come behind our subject and put the arms like this, if we ask her to push out to the sides, this is resisted external rotation of infraspinatus and push towards the front, then that's resisted subscapularis. Frequently in rotator cuff tears, the external rotation is weak and painful. Injection of local anesthetic into the subcromial space is an important part of uh, examination of the shoulder, particularly if one's suspecting cuff pathology. And one would expect uh, 10 millilitres of local anesthetic into that space to abolish the uh, discomfort, which is a positive injection test. So specific tests for subcromial impingement include the near sign, which is to put the hand forwards with the thumb down and ask the subject to push up hard whilst resisting that. That tends to uh, reproduce pain here. Um, and also the Hawkins sign, which is to have the patient with a relaxed arm and then to drop the forearm down into internal rotation at 90 degrees and more anteriorly, which tends to catch the rotator cuff between the greater tuberosity and the uh, subacromial area, reproducing discomfort also. Folks can also get an inflammation of the long head of biceps, <coughs> bicipital tendonitis. So if the hand is put into supination and resisted active flexion of the elbow, fires the long head of biceps, which can then be palpated, and this may reproduce tenderness in this case. If the patient uh, has symptoms of instability or previous dislocation, it's worth examining the patient lying down to look for signs of laxity around the shoulder. The patient needs to be relaxed and one can hold the scapula and clavicle and then the examining hand can push the shoulder posteriorly and lift it anteriorly to look for an excessive glide of the humeral head against the glenoid and that needs to be checked against the other side. Furthermore, in folks who seem to have 
multiple directions of instability. Pulling down on the limb sometimes causes a sulcus to be seen here, and this can also be examined with a patient standing. In a patient with recurrent dislocation, bringing the arm out into a little abduction, and then external rotation, which I would support, may bring on symptoms of apprehension and discomfort, which are often improved by placing a restraining hand on the anterior side of the shoulder. And if that improves the patient's discomfort, that's a positive relocation test and is a sign of a shoulder instability. The signs may be exhibited further down or further up in abduction, depending on exactly where the instability is. A slight word of caution, it is possible to dislocate the shoulder by forcing this too much.